Good morning, everyone. I'm Marty Cady, Managing Editor for Policy for Politico. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for our emergency preparedness event. As always, thanks to everyone joining us on a live stream. This morning, we'll be talking with key players in emergency and disaster response about how they allocate critical resources, plan for the unexpected, and come up with innovative solutions. Politico is very excited to be hosting this event at such a timely moment. We have a really great program this morning. As you know, we were slated to kick things off with a keynote conversation with Police Chief Kathy Lanier. Unfortunately, Chief Lanier had a last minute emergency and can't join us. Instead, we are very pleased to be hosting a one-on-one -on -one conversation between Politico's Tony Rahm and the district's Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, Paul Quander. Deputy Mayor Quander oversees coordination and supervision of all DC public safety agencies. We'll then have a panel discussion with an esteemed group of leaders in emergency preparedness and response, including Congresswoman Susan Brooks, who is chairman of the Subcommittee on Emergency Preparedness Response Communications on the House Homeland Security Committee. T.J. Kennedy, who is Deputy General Manager of FirstNet, Ken Salazar, who is former Secretary of the Interior and the former U.S. Senator from Colorado, and Michael Saylor, who is the Chairman and CEO of MicroStrategy. On behalf of the editorial team here at Politico, we're thrilled to have such a great group on stage representing multiple independent perspectives among both public and private entities. Before we get started, I'd like to say thanks to our sponsor, Northrop Grumman, for their partnership with us on this morning's events. Here to say a few words from Northrop Grumman is Kathy Warden, the Corporate Vice President and President for, of Northrop Grumman Information Systems. Kathy. Well, thank you and good morning. I am really honored to be here and be able to kick off today's events and join this conversation that's happening today on emergency preparedness and public safety. It's a conversation that we've been having at Northrop Grumman for a while. We have over 40 years of experience serving the public safety and communications community, and that's one of the reasons that we're here sponsoring today's event. But more importantly, nearly 11 years ago, the 9-11 Commission was created to prepare an account of the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, 2001. And that commission at the time was also mandated to provide recommendations designed to guard our nation against future attacks. And in the 2004 report, the commission noted that the inability to communicate at the crash sites and the compatible and inadequate communications among public safety organizations at the local, state, and federal levels remains an important problem. And even today, this communication challenge remains as unfinished business. A lot has been done, but our nation needs to address other activities to ensure our emergency preparedness, and it's taking steps to do so. FirstNet is tasked with establishing a nationwide interoperable public safety communications network for resolving communications challenges that emergency responders face. A FirstNet nationwide network will bridge the communication gap for our police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and lead to greater situational awareness when our first responders need it most. Our company's been talking a lot about FirstNet and what we can do to help the network make, become a reality. We know the discussion on FirstNet and public safety must continue, especially as the anniversary of the 9-11 Commission report approaches. We have to finish what we started 10 years ago, and I believe that today will be the start of a discussion and this forum will provide some clarity on what we need to do to make those solutions a reality. Today, the users in the public safety community and those with resources in this community will speak directly to one another. And I'm confident that this communication will provide fruitful for all of us. We'll hear from our distinguished panel of speakers who have ideas on how to address these issues. They'll talk about what is the challenge for FirstNet and for our nation's security. They'll talk about the kind of innovation that's needed to solve the above challenge and other challenges that stand in the way of FirstNet becoming a reality. And they'll talk about what FirstNet users need from those of us who can provide solutions. So I'll be listening as an interested party, both on behalf of myself and Northrop Grumman, to get answers to those questions. And we're prepared to be an ally in completing the unfinished 9-11 business. 
We have past experience in public safety and systems integration, and we have ideas on how to stay ahead of today's evolving cyber threats. All of these will be helpful in resolving the communication challenges. But most of all, at Northrop Grumman, we're here to help, and we're here to participate in the ongoing dialogue that will begin today and continue into the future. So thank you. Kathy, Northrop Grumman, thank you once again for your partnership. Uh, just a few final notes. Uh, you can join our conversation on Twitter with the hashtag, uh, conversation, it's hashtag emergency preparedness, and our moderators will field those questions up here on, on a tablet on stage, uh, and they might answer a few of them. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Politico's Tony Rahm and Deputy Mayor Paul Quander to the stage. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Marty, and thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks so much, Deputy Mayor, for coming out and helping us uh, this morning. Um, I just want to jump right into the conversation. You know, when we're having a discussion here about emergency preparedness, it's hard not to recall the tragic events of the shooting at Navy Yard. And so as we begin to reflect and make changes and think about what's next in improving our ability to handle emergencies and address these threats in real time, I think it's important to ask, what have we learned? What can we do better? What do we need to rethink going forward? We always have to be prepared for the unexpected. We always have to be prepared for no notice type of events. So that means you have to drill you have to exercise, you have to meet people before the event and discuss ways of moving forward, ways of communicating, ways of responding, ways of handling the situation, and then ways of getting back to, um, to normal. So it's an ongoing process, but it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, but it takes a lot of communication. Sure, was there sufficient communication that day? You know, we've heard stories, we've seen these sorts of investigations that have emerged about whether Capitol Police were talking to others, whether there was sufficient information, but was there good communication the day of the Navy Yard shooting? There, there was very good communication. Um, I was in the, the command um, post, Unified Command, we had representatives from the FBI, the National Park Service, um, the Capitol Police, the Marshal Service. There were a number of government entities that were there. The mayor was present as well. And so each of those entities was able to communicate. And that was by design. Um, we have radios for which all of those agencies have, have access. Um, we practice and we partnership. Every time there's a presidential movement, um, MPD, Park Service, and others are there. The communications is, is seamless. So one of the issues that we discovered is that on the channel that we were operating, um, there was too good, too much communication. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we will move towards is how do we limit that communication so that the, um, the most relevant players have access to, to that and we move um, the other communications to another channel. Sure, so it was information overload, essentially, as you guys were trying to make these decisions and interact with the, uh, with the situation in real time. Yes. So I guess to kind of bring that to a bigger picture, though, one of the things we've heard is that you know, there, is, there is the SWAT team that was available at the time. The Capitol Police had recalled them, sent them back to the Capitol. There's been this internal investigation that says they acted appropriately. I'd love your thoughts on this, on the, this, this early findings. The report hasn't been made public. But you know, in this case, is that an example of good communication? Did they do what they were supposed to? What's, what's, what's maybe the lapse there, if there was one? I, I don't know if there was a lapse. I don't know the particular facts. Um, involving the Capitol Police. There was a Capitol Police presence there um, in the command center. Um, we had access to them. Um, but as I've indicated, um, on that day, um, we had um, many people from first responders from MPD, from um, Naval Investigative Services. Um, we were well covered. So the decision to, um, to come and to engage was left to the Capitol Police and their authorities, and I'm not sure what the particulars are. Sure, you know, that just kind of brings it to the bigger question here. 
about information sharing. And whether we're talking about Navy Yard, or we're talking about Sandy, Hurricane Sandy almost did more than a year ago at this point, or we're talking about Boston, lots of information, as you said, an important number of people who have to get it. Sometimes that information doesn't reach the intended targets. How has information sharing between the federal government and DC and the localities evolved over the last couple of years? Well, all of the jurisdictions have gone to a, um, a unified command um, structure, an incident command, whereby if we have an event, whether it's um, a Navy Yard incident, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's some other event, um, the, the, the most appropriate operational unit is the first to um, assume um, command. And then everyone has a role to play. So in this unified command system, um, you set up your communications um, so that you know what resources you have. So it's important that we gather the resources there as soon as we possibly can so that we can take control over a particular area. Then it's a question of how do you support and then how do you move to the next phase of the, um, of the event. So through training, through preparation, through using this incident command system, the communications has become um, much better. Again, we drill and we train. So we we have exercises with um, the local universities, um, from Howard to, to Gallaudet to, to Catholic. We do this on a regular basis so that um, our officers will know how to respond, will know the lay of the land, the universities and others will know what to expect from us so that when we have to respond, we'll know what to do, we know where to go, everyone will know um, what the intended process is. Sure, that, that, that's, that, that's a pretty positive outlook. I mean, when you talk to folks after what happened in Boston, they say that they felt all the information, the critical details were bottled up here in the federal government. It sounds like you're not having that experience necessarily. No, we, we, we've worked at it, and we also have a, a means of communicating with the outside world. We have a, a fusion center. It's um, um, a tactical center that gathers information in. And so they had access to our um, police communications. So we were able to communicate with um, others um, throughout the country in a, in a secure environment so that other jurisdictions would know exactly what was transpiring here in the district. The concern for many jurisdictions is that if an event takes place here um, in the District of Columbia, is there something else that could impact their jurisdiction? So we need to always be prepared. Again, we don't know what to expect. Just because an event is taking place here in the district, there may be plans for an event to take place in Richmond or San Diego or some other part. So we need to share information so police chiefs and other first responders throughout the country will know what is going on, good, accurate, information so that they can make the appropriate adjustments. Sure, you mentioned the importance of that coordination and one of the things that sticks out to me from Navy Yard is something that uh, the Department of Homeland Security's Chief Security Officer had said at a hearing before the House Homeland Security Committee and we'll hear from one of their key members later in the panel discussion, but you know, what he had said was that he had heard, quote, secondhand interoperability problems uh, among public safety officials sharing information in the field, and that this had been especially the case with DHS, that so they weren't really able to kind of get into the conversation to share the knowledge that you all had and to respond accordingly. So were you aware of some of these interoperability problems? Is this a challenge? I'm not aware of any interoperability problems. Let, let's set the context. Sure. Um, and I, I can't get into to, to too many of the specifics, but essentially this was an event that was handled um, primarily by a local police force. And the Metropolitan Police Department um, responded rapidly um, along with the Park Service and they initiated contact. They went into the building, they did what they were supposed to do. You don't wait, you have to respond. So during the course of the, the the unfolding of these events, there was great communications. There was no problem in communicating. We knew what was going on. There was support that was being arranged. Uh, medical care was being coordinated. All of that was, was working well. So I'm unaware of any issues related to interoperability problems. If so, that may have taken place after. It may have been with others who were not primarily involved in the mission at hand. And so as far as the response and the uh, remediation, um, 
I'm unaware of any interoperability sure. issues. You know, the, the word from the federal government here in D.C. is that public safety communications writ large just aren't up to date. You know, they want to be able to enable first responders to use iPhones and tablets like this one to communicate in the field, to share building schematics. But members of Congress, other federal agencies say that the technica technical capabilities just aren't there yet. That's behind the first net that, you know, we had heard while we were waiting to come up here on stage. Give us your assessment, though, of, of public safety's ability to communicate and the technical tools they have here. Are they severely out of date? No, we're actually, we're moving um, in the direction that you just spoke of whereby um, our first responders will be able to get schematics, will be able to get video as they are um, approaching a scene. We're using technology now um, with our Metropolitan Police Department. We have a technology that's known as um, Shot Spotter. So whenever there's a shot that goes off in the District of Columbia where we have these sensors, um, there's an alert. But what we're moving to is cameras connected to that and we've started to, to um, deploy them so that not only when the shot spotted detects, the cameras will actually move in the direction of the, um, the shot so that we can have video. The next phase will be to put that video in the, the squad car so that the responding officers will have access to that information. So there are a lot of technological advances that are um, forthcoming and that we're working with various partners to, um, to bring into existence. So I'm very excited about where we're going in the direction um, that we're using. Um, this is not granddad's um, police department <laughs> anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess though, you mentioned video, you mentioned having these cameras. We all know the very significant role that video had played in figuring out what had happened in Boston. And so emerging from that was this rather pronounced debate that's kind of stuck with us about privacy and security. Talk about that a little bit here. How do you balance the two of those, the need to ferret out the next crisis or deal with it versus, you know, one civil liberties? I think civil liberties um, has to be at the forefront of any discussion about, um, about video, but I think there's a way that we can do it in concert, in harmony. Um, there's a lot of information that is, that is out there. I mean, as we walk the, the streets, um, we are subject to being picked up by video, by other sorts of um, technologies. Um, there's no audio uh, associated, so we're not listening. No one is listening to conversations. But I think as we um, proceed, video is going to be um, extremely important. It's important in the regular um, police cases where we solve crimes because someone was speeding and we get a, a tag. Um, we use license plate readers to track um, individuals um, um, when we get silver alerts, senior citizens who have gone missing and who are driving. We can pick up from um, um, license plate readers the locations of the car so we know where to start looking. So there are these technologies that are here and now and we just have to balance it to make sure that we um, are mindful of uh, First Amendment rights but at the same time, we're, we're using the technology to advance public safety and personal safety as much as we possibly can. Sure, although, you know, we hear these doomsday stories. I mean, there was this very large report, I believe it was in the Washington Post, about local authorities that are compiling these facial recognition databases, for instance, that are able to do plenty of work by taking a driver's license or other sorts of biometric data, putting them into one warehouse, and then deploying it in the field. And so with that, there are plenty of privacy concerns. Do you think that folks are just overreacting because of a lack of understanding here, or, or are some of these fears justified? I think that we're at the beginning stages of new technologies. And whenever you're there, there are always going to be um, concerns, rightfully so. But I think the job of um, public officials and um, technology um, organizations is to address those concerns, to, to meet with um, individuals that have issues so that there's a common understanding about the benefit to be gained. You can have a, a great product, um, but if, if the community at large doesn't accept it, is fearful of it, then you have nothing. So the idea is to have that great product, to educate the public so that they see the benefit. And then that's how things develop, that's how we grow, and that's how we become safer. Sure, you mentioned new technology, so we definitely have to delve into social media. I mean, the way in which folks responded to Navy Yard, to Boston, to the crises that preceded it, 
lots of misinformation out there, lots of discussion and speculation. You know, when you're sitting in headquarters, you're watching the events play out during the day in which the Navy Yard catastrophe occurred. Do you see this information? Does it factor into anything? Is there like a moment of frustration where you know the information is wrong? What do you do about it? We have to manage it. That's, that's part of the, the structure of a um, of unified command is to establish um, your joint information center. And you want to make sure that the information that is being disseminated is, is accurate. Um, so we pay attention to social media so that we can respond. If we see an inaccuracy there and if it's major, we will respond um, immediately so that um, the public um, has the right information. That's why it's important during the Navy Yard that we establish times when the mayor would go out and would address the media so that the media could have access to the correct information. Then we would supplement it. The problem that we had was that there was such a great push of, of, of media that the PIOs for the, for the representatives um, that were there really couldn't hear the responses that were given. So we, on the way back, we would talk to our uh, representatives um, as to what the questions were and what the responses were so that we could follow up. But we spent a lot of time um, in, with our um, Joint Information Center um, following social media, making sure that the information was accurate. If there were any inaccuracies, getting out the correct information so that individuals would know. We were on a lockdown situation in that area. And part of the way that we communicate is through social media, through um, Twitter, through uh, Facebook. So the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Transportation, um, Homeland Security, all of these entities were giving out information um, as real time as to where we are and how to advise the public and to set the expectation so that people would know. Sure, I want to delve into how you guys communicate in just a moment, but you know, when it comes to correcting the misinformation, as you put it, who's doing that? Like, what team is sitting behind the scenes looking at these tweets, looking at these posts on a place like Reddit, what are they doing to correct the misinformation specifically? Well, as I indicated, we have um, a fusion center and we have um, analysts that are, that are there. So that's one unit that is in someone's job or a couple of people's job when you have an incident like this is to, to manage the, the social media. Um, we also, as I mentioned, set up a joint information center where we have PIOs in, in the lead PIO in this instant was um, from the Metropolitan Police Department, but you also had support um, PIOs that were there. So they monitor as well. So uh, the Joint Information Center would contact um, me. Um, I was in the Unified Command Center. They would say, is this accurate? We would provide the accurate information so that we could make sure that the public was uh, aware. And we wanted to do it quickly. The other thing that we have the capability of doing um, in an emergency situation, we can actually push out notices to, um, to the public through the smartphones. If any of you were here this summer, there were a couple of thunderstorms, and you may have gotten a, an alert from the National Weather Service. Um, it was uninvited, um, but it was letting you know that there were, were thunderstorms that were um, imminent and that you needed to take appropriate action. That's a part of a system that allows us, if we need to, to push out information to you to alert you that there is a situation and what action you need to take. Sure, I want to get back to social media, but since you mentioned the alerts, there were a lot of people who were quite annoyed to get those alerts, actually. You know, I remember getting about 15 of them, you know, between the hours of about midnight and two in the morning one night when there was a particularly bad storm outside. How do you combat that problem while at the same time not deterring, you know, the average American from just turning off the alert and not getting any information at all? Well, the, the, we, it, it's a new technology, mm -hmm. and we have to make sure that the policies and the procedures are in place and that it is used only in um, circumstances that warrant it. Um, two or three o'clock in the morning to <laughs> advise you of a storm may not be the best use. But again, it's beginning new technology. We are working out some of the procedures. Um, but the main thing is if we need to get to you, we can and it's pushed to you automatically. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an advancement that we didn't have in the past, we have now, and we will use it as appropriate. Is it, is it a justifiable fear that people might just turn it off entirely, that we might get to the point where it's so saturated, folks are so annoyed to get these alerts that they turn them off and then the information is useless? Is this something that's been thought about you know, in the ranks of government? 
you're suggesting that people will actually turn off their smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> the alert on this smartphone, not the smartphone. This thing never turns off. <laughs> never. How dare you? <laughs> no, I think, it, it, again, it has to be balanced. And it has to be information that people um, feel is, is um, germane and important. You can't oversaturate. You can't alert on everything. But on the other hand, you have some people that say, I want to know everything. This is a form for media, isn't it? Media likes to know everything, but your normal um, citizen does not. So we have to be succinct, we have to be precise, and we have to be measured. Sure. You know, considering the amount of time and effort and resources invested into, you know, the district's use of social media, things like Twitter. I know you guys launched a Twitter earlier this year. You have a specific Twitter account uh, from earlier this summer. Um, is it reaching people? Do we know if this is actually reaching folks in the district? Yeah, it, it, it is, and we're, we're getting responses. And what you want to do is you want to get your message out there. You want to be accessible. You want people to feel like they are connected to government, that they have um, an opportunity to connect and to express themselves. And what, you, what is really amazing is when they connect and then when they get a response, um, people feel that the process has been validated. They feel like they are a part of the system, and so they are engaged, and that's always benef beneficial. Whenever you can engage the public in government activities, um, that's a wonderful thing. Sure. At the same time, though, I imagine you have to combat what essentially is a digital divide in this country. Not everyone is using all of these sorts of services, so if you concentrate all of your efforts in one space online, presumably you won't reach everybody. Is this a concern for... Well, no. It, it has to be balanced, and so um, at one end, end of the spectrum, um, we talk about high tech and all of the new technologies. On the other end of the spectrum, I need to be able to function if all of that goes away. If I can't um, communicate electronically, how do I communicate? What do we do um, to make sure that I can communicate with the citizens and with other government officials? So you can have the high tech on one end, but you still have to have uh, paper and pen and other means that we may have used 10 years ago that's still viable that will allow us to communicate. Sure. I mean, you mentioned needing to have a backstop, but as everyone here knew from when the earthquake hit to the inauguration, when it was incredibly difficult to make phone calls, send text messages, it's quite easy for the commercial carriers to be overloaded. Is that a concern for you all? Do the commercial carriers need to do a better job of bulking up in you know, times of emergencies when there's high demand for those services to make sure that most people can communicate? I think there are there's work to be done, and I think that um, the communications industry is a partner with us and that we need to continue um, working. There are too many examples of high demand um, when you have um, an event that takes place. And we know some of the, um, um, the issues that, that, that stem from that. So there's work to be done there and the communications industry is a partner and we need to continue working. Sure, but on a day like the inauguration when it was almost impossible to send a text message, an emergency of some kind happens and you're trying to reach out, you're trying to dial 911, you're trying to send a text message to a friend to get help. Presumably that help doesn't get through when things are overloaded. So does there need to be more done on the part of the commercial carriers to fix this problem? Well, you have to break it up. Text messaging is one of the, one of the most reliable means um, and that very rarely um, is impacted. And so when your, your regular phone voice communications is impacted, the protocol is to go to text messaging, which works well. Law enforcement personnel, we have other means of communications, either through radios or through satellite phones or other means. But for the public um, at large, it, it is an issue that we need to continue to work on, but the public should be aware that texting is an option that is available in these high um, demand um, zones. Sure, let's go to a couple questions from the audience and remember uh, the hashtag is emergency preparedness. The first, you know, we have a pretty DC crowd here, but there are plenty of folks who are watching who aren't from DC. So explain to us what specific and different obligations you have doing this job explicitly in the capital region in DC. It's a very unique area. So give folks a, a better understanding of what makes it so unique. Uh, well, here in the district, um, you know, we're surrounded by um, Maryland and Virginia, and there is a, a cooperative relationship. I also serve as the, the chairman of the Emergency Preparedness Council for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And what that means is that as a region, we take a look at, at public safety and how we can operate as a region um, better. 
an event that takes place in the District of Columbia will have an impact on Arlington and Fairfax and Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. So we share um, resources, we share um, um, grant opportunities so that we can make the region um, better prepared. For example, um, the events of the Navy Yard, if they took a, 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 a horrible turn and we had many more victims, there's a system in place that allows us to know which hospitals, not only in the District of Columbia, but in Maryland and Virginia, would be available to um, take our patients. And we could specialize. So you have systems that are in place regionally to support each other. Sure, but that's the interaction with the other states. How about with between the D.C. and you know, D.C. government, D.C. law enforcement, and the federal government. That's a pretty unique relationship, obviously, that's not maybe so easily apparent. Has that been a source of strain? No, no it's, um, and I'm gonna, I'm a, I guess I'm a prime example of that. In my career, I've spent half of my career on the federal side and the other half on the, the district side. I'm a native Washingtonian. And so it's the way that things have, have been for years. We work well together. I also serve as the, the chair of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, where we have local um, officials, we have federal officials, we have the Superior Court, and we have the legislature. So you have the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Parole Commission and others, which are federal entities, interacting with the Metropolitan Police Department and Corrections and so forth. And so it's a way that we have um, been working for years, and there's a lot of cooperation. The bottom line is, in order to get things done, we have to play well in the, sl in the sandbox together. And we do. There isn't a lot of bickering. Um, it's how do you get things done. Every now and then there may be a hiccup, but we can go into the room, we can um, resolve those issues, and we can move forward. At the, the grassroots level, at the lowest level, there are no issues. At my level, there aren't any issues. We work through issues. Great. Well, it's a very positive take on that. I think plenty of people in D.C. I think would argue that the relationship between the federal government and you know D.C. has been pretty strained recently. You know, in areas far beyond that of emergency preparedness when it comes to local governance issues. But it sounds like you're pretty happy with the balance these days. Oh, right, right. Let me get my plug in for statehood. Of course, I'm disappointed <laughs> about that. All right. But as far as public safety and doing what is necessary to make sure that our residents and visitors and businesses are, are safe, then I think the relationship is, is strong. I think it um, can be a model in certain respects. Sometimes people look at the negative and don't take a look at the larger picture. When you see what goes well, and the Navy Yard is a good example of um, different groups coming together, playing different roles, um, it was an amazing thing to see all of these entities out there responding. A lot of people don't know that even uh, some of the supporting and surrounding jurisdictions, um, the fire departments, came in to relieve our firefighters. So you have this cooperative spirit from the federal government and the local government to make things work. We're one large community, um, and a lot is going along very well. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to wrap at this point. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor, for coming to join us. We really Thank appreciate you. the time. Right. Thank you. I'm now going to welcome uh, my colleague Brooks and the rest of our panel to the stage once I play some musical chairs. <laughs> Well, thanks so much to all of you. If you missed the introduction at the beginning of it, we've got Congresswoman Susan Brooks, the Chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Emergency Preparedness of the House Homeland Security Committee, uh, TJ Kennedy, the Deputy General Manager of FirstNet, uh, Ken Salazar, former Secretary of the Interior and former U.S. Senator, and uh, Michael Saylor, Chairman and CEO of MicroStrategy. We just ended our conversation on a note about Navy Yard, and we heard a pretty optimistic take from the deputy mayor about how well the federal government and local law enforcement agencies did in responding to the crisis. But I'd be very interested to hear from all of you what your assessment was. What did we learn? What did we do well? What could we have done better? There are plenty of folks who say there are plenty of things we could have done better, and Congresswoman, I'll start with you. 
Well, thank you. Um, actually, the uh, Navy Yard has been reviewed by other committees. It actually has not yet been reviewed by the Emergency Preparedness Response and Communications Subcommittee that I chair. But I think what the challenge is, particularly in a community like this, is how many different law enforcement and first responder community or jurisdictions there are, and how do they communicate? I'm uh, I'm a former deputy mayor of Indianapolis, and it's much easier when you have one police department and one sheriff department, one fire department to communicate with. And so I think that is the challenge in a community like this: is how do they uh, come together, communicate, ensure that um, you know that they are very focused and that they have the communication. I think that's the greatest challenge. Sure, and we touched upon that at the end of our conversation. You've got Capitol Police, you've yes. got uh, Metro PD, you've got the federal government here. From your experience, have those folks worked well together? Do you see good or bad things when you look at the picture? Well, I certainly know. Um, I'm also a former U.S. attorney, and after 9-11, we ha said to the federal government, federal authorities, and uh, that it was imperative that they work with state and local law enforcement because at the end of the day, when you have an incident, it's not the federal authorities who are the ones that kind of come to the rescue. <laughs> Citizens, if they're in a crisis or they're in a disaster, whether man-made or natural, they go to the locals first. The locals who are truly in charge, whether it's the fire department or the police department, that is where I think we need to ensure we have the most resources. And then the state and the federal jurisdictions come in after that. But you know, my view and what we need to be focused on is ensuring that the local jurisdictions have the resources they need, the communication capabilities they need, so that they can then reach out to state and, local, and, state and the federal authorities. Let me take you back, if I may, uh, sure. just because I think it's important to put this issue in a historical context. And yes, uh, every time there's an incident that comes up like the Navy Yard, you learn about what you can do better. But I think if you look back in time through the 1990s, I was Attorney General in Colorado at the time that the Columbine killings occurred on April 20th of 1999. And at that point in time in Colorado, not unlike Indianapolis here, uh, Congressman, but there was a whole host of uh, governmental entities that responded from local police departments to the sheriff to state to federal agencies. At the end of the day, there was a complete set of problems around communication, interoperability, a lack of understanding of who was actually in charge, uh, chaos and confusion. Fast forward to the Navy Yard shooting, and at least from what I was able to see from television, it seemed like at least there was a unified response. And you think about how law enforcement has worked here across multiple jurisdictions in the Washington, D.C. area on a whole host of events. I think it's gotten a lot better. Sure. TJ, we'll dig into the intricacies of FirstNet and communication in just a bit, but give us your assessment here. Sure. I think more from the public safety perspective, being a former police officer myself and having worked on big events uh, leading up in the late 90s to the 2002 Winter Olympics, um, where we plan for public safety and communications of many agencies, federal, state, and local. Um, I, I think that after a lot of the incidents in the 90s, we really learned that we had to learn th work through the CONOPS and the unified command issues, and so much has gotten better. And I think the Navy Yard shooting is a great example of that, where a lot of the operational training and issues were, I, I think, resolved and very well done. And so I think that the human side of, of public safety has come such a long way through relationships and training and working together that the communications <coughs> will just help supplant that. So I think it's really improved greatly. Sure, Michael. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on uh, on on those matters, but uh, what I do think is that that um, people do the best with the technology they have at hand, and a lot of the technology we've used is 20th century technology. And if you look at the, what's coming in the 21st century, we're going to have 950 million smartphones that are going to move this year. Every one of them is a transponder. So the way that we would manage ships or manage planes is we have a, tran a transponder and they squawk and we know where they are in the sky at all times. But I got to wonder, if I got hired as a Capitol policeman the day before the event, how would someone from a different jurisdiction even know that I'm legitimate if they were standing in front of me? Like they would look at my uniform and my badge. Now, how do you present a badge on radio? And how do you present a badge in cyberspace? And I think the great opportunity of uh, FirstNet and the great opportunity of technology is you can create a badge for a dozen different jurisdictions. You can issue it in a minute. And then you could take an iPad and you could see exactly every resource within one click squawking every 10 seconds. 
And at that point, you could dynamically create your own uh, radio group. Right? If I talk on an open channel, everybody hears me. So how do I dynamically say, I just want to talk to those 37 people and give that instruction? And if I did, how would they know that I'm the person in charge? Right? And uh, I think that's a great opportunity right now, the ability to uh, take advantage of digital technology and smartphone technology and intelligent networks. The, the, if you look at the social network, the Snapchats, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the thing that prints so much power is you guys created a network just for this event, right? You created a hashtag on Twitter for this event, and you did it very rapidly. You walked in the room, and you told everybody, and now everybody's on the same network, and it took you 10 seconds. So if we could take something like that, but of course uh, do it in a legitimate, civically responsible way, uh, and then offer that to the thousands of sub-networks that are involved in first response, I think we could uh, make the job of all the first responders easier and de-stress the situation. Sure, so there are two strains there. There's both social networking and then there's first net. So let's break them apart. Brooks. Well, the, uh, um, actually, I, I think we want to break it apart a little bit different. What we're really talking about here is broadly two networks. There's a network going in and there's a network going out. And the network going in is the network that I deal with mostly. That's 911. That's how do you call a cop? How do you call an ambulance? How do they find you once you've called them? Then there's the network going out, which is basically once my call goes in, how is that call dispatched to the proper authority to respond to that call? So the two, it, they, they have similar, uh, they have similar technologies, but they're used in a different way. And so, you know, and if, you're, if you have a landline phone, of which only about, you know, between 25 and 30 percent of us do now, if you pick up that landline phone and you dial 911, the police know where you are. If you pick up your cell phone and you dial 911, they may, they may not. That's a technical issue that's somewhat different than the technical issues that we're dealing with at FirstNet. Now, when you're talking about how to deal with uh, social media, that opens up an entirely new sort of facet of this discussion. So, you know, you get a bunch of people tweeting. What, if, if I'm, if the Navy used the Navy Yard shooting, I was coming up to the Capitol, I might want to know that there's been some incident that goes on. And, you know, maybe the first thing I know is that Tony Rom sent out a tweet. He's on my Twitter feed. And, you know, do I trust Tony Rom? You I mean, should. That becomes the issue. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 but, you know, I'm, I'm going to shut up here. But you, you, end up with, you end up with a constitutional problem there. What, do we shut down Twitter when there's an incident like the Navy Yard? <coughs> Does that help anybody? Does that hurt anybody? Uh, you know, I don't think you can do it. So let's turn to the panel to get their thoughts on, on, on the role of social networking here, the role of social media, especially given the way folks used it in responding to Navy Yard and to Boston Congresswoman. Well, and um, when I first, uh, and I'm a freshman member of Congress, and uh, in my first uh, tour of the Red Cross, and this is post-Sandy, of course, so just this year, um, that's where I really learned about the role of social media in the wake of a disaster. They showed us, and I think Sandy was the first time where really social media had been used to the extent that it was. And um, we just had hurricanes in, or not hurricanes, Tornado. tornadoes in uh, Indiana and Illinois this uh, past weekend. And I visited those tornado um, hit areas in my district. And lo and behold, and I was very pleased to learn that our local police department and fire department was using social media. They were posting on Facebook on a regular basis what was being used. And I think for any of you who have young uh, people in your household, and I'm the mom of a 20 and a 23-year-old, that is where they're getting their news. That is where they are getting. They are not inclined to call 911. Um, they're actually posting, and that's what we learned from Red Cross. People were posting that they were trapped. Law enforcement after Boston were learning about things through Twitter and through Facebook. And so that is what we have been trying to talk about in our committee and with any public safety officials I'm with, is that they have got to realize that is actually, I think, the not just the future, it's here now. They 
have to be communicating through Twitter and Facebook uh, to their citizens about how they want them to respond, where the disasters are, where the danger is, and then they have to be able to receive those responses and figure out how to respond and uh, pay attention to those Facebook posts. Sure, and just to put a number on it, you know, a FEMA report from 2013 said that there were 20 million Sandy-related tweets, even with loss of cell service over the period they had surveyed, just to give you a sense of the magnitude there. But the other half of that is how do you break through the noise? There's so much happening on a place like Twitter. A lot of it isn't necessarily accurate. We saw what happens when misinformation spreads. We even saw what happens when misinformation spreads through official channels as reporters rush to break news. How do you address that from an emergency responder position? How do you cut through the noise and make sure the right message is the one that's getting out there? I think in one case, you can look at the, the Boston uh, bombings in the past year, and I think Boston PD did a spectacular job of correcting information and putting out solid information from their official site. And by doing that and looking at um, you know, official law enforcement or fire department websites that are putting out information, they can certainly help correct the issue if there's things that are out there that are wrong. But also, much like the Congresswoman said, I think it's very important that we're, we're reaching a different audience with social media. We're re reaching a lot of the younger generation as well as getting information, whether it's somebody reporting they're trapped or they have an issue. And I think that law enforcement is responding very well to that. They're embracing the need to monitor um, all social media to be able to provide quick responses, and especially during these you know, big disasters or larger disasters where some traditional communications may be cut off. Can I make a comment? Sure. Um, you know, studying the mobile wave started about 2009. For the last four years, we've been in the era of social identity, and you are who you say you are on your mobile phone and in cyberspace. So you have a Gmail account and a Twitter account and a Facebook account, but no one ever cleared customs and dollars with their Facebook ID, <laughs> right? And uh, nor with their Twitter ID. So that's the source of the noise. We're about to move into an era of civic identity. You are who your government says you are or corporate identity. You are who the bank says you are. Uh, if I walk up to a DMV and I walk to an iris scan, a $2,000 device can affix my driver's license identity to my smartphone. At the point that you had um, a civic identity on a, on a smartphone or a police badge on a smartphone or a, um, a mayor's badge on a smartphone, you could seal your message. You could seal your Twitter message or you could uh, sign and seal any kind of communication with a civic identity which, which certifies it. It's like a certified check, right? I can write you something. I could say, here's $10,000 on a sheet of paper. It's worth nothing to you. Or I could hand you a sheet of paper that's a certified check from Bank of America and is worth a lot to you. So at the point that you can take your civic identity and you can wrap and seal a message, right? And FirstNet, by the way, is sort of about this, this idea, how do you have a legitimate civic social network? But you could, you could take any kind of civic identity. You could, you could place it in Facebook or place it into Twitter the rest you would have a mechanism to go from random noise, somebody said that they're a policeman, to certification, this person is certified by the government to be a policeman, and then that would legitimize a lot of this messaging and help you cut through the noise. Sure. Let's turn our attention to FirstNet for a moment. You know, we've heard a lot of conversation about it. Open the event with it. In fact, the seven billion dollar network. TJ, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You know, one of the things that that, that we had reported today is that this network, once thought to cost 15 billion dollars, was given significantly less than that at about seven billion dollars. So now the question is, who's going to front the bill? Are you guys confident that public safety folks are going to be willing to pay whatever user fees might ultimately result through this network? Um, that being the huge harbinger of whether this thing is a success or a failure, essentially. I think public safety fought very hard to get this network, uh, much like a number of folks have mentioned up here. I think that for a very long time, we've seen the need for a nationwide interoperable network. Um, I certainly think with where broadband is going and being able to give those great capabilities to police officers, firefighters, and paramedics in the field, we need it now more than ever. And I think that's the reason why public safety fought to make this a reality. Um, we've been able to get both funding and spectrum to be able to make it happen. And I think that uh, there's a very large uh, push to be able to continue to move forward. And FirstNet is ramping up very quickly to do that. We have great support from our, our, our brethren in public safety to be able to make it happen. And I think that as we move forward, we'll be able to prove that uh, we can roll out terrific capability across the country that is really sorely needed. And, uh, 
it's great to see public safety come together, both police, fire, and EMS, also from federal, state, and local levels all working together. And I think that's the great part about FirstNet, and that's the reason why I took this job. Sure, and when we say $7 billion, what we actually need is $2 billion now and $5 billion at some point when the FCC finishes its incentive auctions, the idea to recoup airways from broadcasters and resell them here. So in the event that FirstNet begins to conduct its business, starts to spend money, starts to put down the, the groundwork for this network, <coughs> And the incentive auction finds itself in a not so great position where deadlines are being pushed farther back past 2014. Does that put FirstNet in a serious bind? Are you guys going to have a money problem if the dominoes start to fall in the incentive auction? I'm feeling very confident about the incentive auctions. Um, I've talked to a lot of very smart people who are quite familiar with what's going to happen with the upcoming auctions. And uh, they're giving me good confidence um, that they should be successful. So uh, the first ones are coming up uh, very soon in 2014. And I think let's wait and see how they go. But uh, I feel very good about where they're going to be going. Let me jump in here. I, th I think that there's a, a broader question here. And, and that is, uh, how do we as a society make sure that we are financing what a government does? And that's uh, to take care of the public safety of the people that we represent. In the case of FirstNet, obviously, the Congress decided to go through the auction in order to be able to finance it. But the reality of it is, if you look at what's happened uh, in any incident from 9-11 to other kinds of things that we had to deal with in the country, at the time that there's a tragedy and people are dying and the country is in very, a very difficult circumstance, you have people flocking to finance these kinds of, of, of programs because they're good to protect the country. Uh, but then it goes off, gets off of the headlines, and all of a sudden it, it's not as important as it used to be. You know, my time as a U.S. Senator, I spent a lot of time in the rural parts of Colorado, and we were working on interoperability. The urban areas had it, rural America didn't, okay? And so huge, huge differences between urban areas and, and rural areas, which still exist today. But at the end of the day, and that's part of the job that the Congress uh, has, is you have to make sure that you're investing in, in these technologies, and it's going to take money. I mean, I don't know what the sequester impacts are on some of these issues, but I will tell you, that unless you are investing in these technologies, uh, you're not going to be able to keep up with uh, with the changes and the needs. Sure. Just to follow up there, if, if if there isn't something that you know kicks Congress into giving this thing some more money, and we continue on the current path, are you confident that there's going to be enough funding to build out FirstNet to those rural areas that aren't necessarily part of the system, don't have good enough coverage right now? Well, I, I'm not specifically familiar with everything that's going on on the budget for for FirstNet, but I will say this that. Uh, I think the issue is much broader than just FirstNet. It really is the functions of, of a government and how you support the funding of the government. I mean, if you see the government shut down a few weeks ago, uh, you look at the consequences of the sequester, what is happening with uh, funding and how it affects both the Department of Commerce and Homeland Security. Those are huge consequences. And at the end of the day, if uh, we in the United States are going to keep up with uh, the need to make sure that we are protecting the, the, the public safety of our people, as well as the privacy concerns that people have legitimately under our Constitution here in this country, it's going to take some investment. Uh, government does good things for people, but one of the principal responsibilities for government is to make sure that we are being protected, and they can't do that without the investment that's necessary. Sure, Congresswoman. Tony, I'd just like to share that um, I agree that it is certainly government's top role is the safety and security of its people. But I think that FirstNet is a classic example of a strong public-private partnership. And in public-private partnerships, I'm from Indianapolis, we've been doing public-private partnerships you know, since the early 90s. There are always a lot of challenges when you bring the private sector and the public sector together in the same mission. And um, you know, I uh, you know admire where I'm. I'm frustrated, though, quite frankly, because uh, FirstNet was something that the 9/11 Commission recommended back in you know 2003. Here we are, 2013. We're really kind of just getting started, and I think that uh, with the danger that this country faces from a lot of different threats around the world, the world's not getting any safer. Quite frankly, we need to accelerate these conversations. And so I appreciate this. We need to accelerate what is the public sector's role, what is the private sector's role? How will it get funded? You know, I applaud Greg Walden for, you know, having hearings and talking about this, but we have to keep a focus on this because it has to ramp up, I think, much faster than it's ramping up. So
so you're not comfortable with the speed at which it's moved. You'd like to see it do a particular thing differently? A absolutely. We had uh, Indianapolis firefighters, or maybe they were part of Task Force One, went to Hurricane Sandy to help with that response. When they got to the East Coast, they were in a. They had a period of days that they could not communicate and figure out what, uh, where their services were needed most. That's a classic example of you know valuable public resources that went to assist in a disaster, and they were stuck for a couple of days trying to figure out exactly where they were needed, and that is because the communication wasn't working. If we had a, a functioning first net system, then we wouldn't be moving those resources you know, to a place where they're sitting. It was very frustrating for them. So this happens all the time, and we need to accelerate this discussion and figure how, how, how it's going to be funded. And I wouldn't say that with what's happening with our federal government, that the federal government funding is going to be the way to go. Let me jump in. I think two things. I, I agree that we've waited a long time since the 9-11 report to make this happen, and now that we have, we're moving full speed ahead. We're hiring up great staff. We're getting key minds together. I just finished a, a couple days out in Boulder, Colorado, where our technical headquarters is going to be with our public safety lab out there that's been working on interoperability for many years. And what's great is we brought together the private sector and the public sector. We had about 170 uh, lead technology and interoperability experts from both public safety at the city, county, and state level. We also had some great federal experts, and we had a lot of industry. I would say three quarters of the room was filled with industry. I see some of them in the room here today as well. And we need the smart minds from both industry and the public sector to be able to make this happen. And we've seen that. And I think everybody's really rallied behind this. This is a, a once in a lifetime event for public safety in my career because we're, at, we're fixing a major issue that's been there for a long time. And I think the example of going from Indiana to New Jersey is a perfect example. We've often had systems that are very focused on local communities. And now we have the ability to have one nationwide network where if a group goes from Indiana to help folks in New Jersey during an emergency, they'll be able to communicate right off the bat. And that's really the promise of FirstNet. And I'm very much looking forward to that. We're moving very quickly. Uh, we've got great support from Congress. We've got great support from our public safety personnel. And we're moving as quickly as possible now, which is really an exciting time. There, there are a couple of things here that I just jump in here. On the funding issue, uh, in January, the first auction is going to happen. And it's not the broadcast incentive auction, what we in the trade call the 600 megahertz auction. This is what is called the H block auction, which is a different sliver of the uh, frequencies. Uh, that's going to be about, uh, there's a reserve price of like 1.2 billion. So, you know, I don't know how that works. The check goes to the treasury. Do they write the check to you? So you guys, you guys will have, you know, kind of might work as a sort of a bridge between the 600 megahertz auction, which uh, the FCC has said they want to do in 2014. But the law actually says it's like 2020. It's a long way out before they absolutely have to do it. The other thing is Sandy is an interesting uh, issue because one of the problems with Sandy was that the communication system in nearly its entirety was swept away by the storm. So I don't know how FirstNet would deal with that issue. I'm sure there's redundancies built into it. Maybe you could piggyback on the New York system if FirstNet was in there. But you know, part of the problem was, you know, it, it just wasn't there. The entire wireline system on the west side of the island disappeared. The uh, cell phone towers and things like that were knocked down, and it took time to get the uh, temporary facilities uh, operating. So I, so, so I just don't know. I mean, how would FirstNet deal with a situation like Sandy or like where some of the places where the tornadoes have that it's just pavement or beach? Sure. It's a great question, Brooks. I think that you, you can't prevent you know, Mother Nature from taking away a, a tower that happens to have great communications on it or, or really well, inter... Uh, in a, and, and I was just thinking, in, in 911, of course, when the, when the towers came down, that had a lot of uh, uh, telecommunications facilities set on top of the uh, World Trade Center. I'm sorry. Very true. I, I think the key for us is reliability and redundancy. And one of the things is we're not building a commercial network. We're building a public safety network. And because of that, we're looking really hard at the reliability and redundancy concerns. One of the things we've seen with a lot of storms and other issues is the lack of generator power, the lack of enough battery power to last longer during emergencies. And some of these emergencies we've seen lately, they've lasted for a longer period of time. I mean, even here in Northern Virginia two years ago, you know, we had the derecho come through and, and knock out power for two days to a fairly suburban and urban area. And so the reality is we know we have to look at the reliability and redundancy from a public safety perspective and make sure that we have generator power. If you look at uh, NYPD system uh, during Hurricane Sandy, they had terrific reliability and redundancy on that system because they built in the power backup that needed to be there for the long term. And so we're looking at those kind of lessons learned to make sure we apply them to first in, in some places, the uh, wireline facility Verizon used, their wire center was flooded and stopped sure. working. 
Um, but the, one of the questions for FirstNet, and you're t it is not a commercial network, but I thought part of the pr thing about FirstNet was to use off-the-shelf componentry to basically, uh, there's so, uh, the, the, you know, iPhones and all this sort of stuff and Cisco and, and the people that make the, the, back, the backbone uh, architecture. Uh, they, they, they do work fairly well. So, I mean, d is there a problem with grafting on the uh, basically off-the-shelf commercial components to a hardened uh, uh, si uh, system like this? There's no problem at all in doing that. What I was focusing on is the reliability <coughs> and redundancy. And so building that in costs a little bit more to be able to have that extra battery power, to have that generator power, to make sure they're fueled, to make sure they're tested, um, and do some of those kinds of things. It's still COTS technology. It's very much off the shelf. So I think we're, we're totally in sync there. Sure. Michael, I, I want to turn it to you and get your thoughts here. We, we've heard a lot about this public-private partnership, especially with respect to FirstNet. And you talked a little bit about the opportunity when it comes to identity, um, ensuring the folks who are talking are the folks who say they're talking. But when you look more broadly at something like FirstNet, and this is something I know a lot of people here are very interested in, when you look at FirstNet, do you see it as a business opportunity? Do you see the sort of thing as, oh, geez, we don't want to get involved in the government here? What's a, what do you see when you look at this network from a private sector standpoint? Um, I think if you look at the big picture, uh, 15 years ago I went through the internet wave and about 5% of the economy dematerialized to software. And you saw some big winners like Amazon and Yahoo um, and eBay. I think uh, during the mobile wave, we're seeing about 50% of the economy dematerialize to software. So things like newspapers, magazines, books, music, all these, all these parts of the economy, and shortly, to, shortly we'll see healthcare, banking, insurance, et cetera, they're all becoming software programs. And, and the private sector has shown a boundless uh, enthusiasm for the following thesis. In every single part of our economy, there's going to be a either national or even more likely international network that's going to become predominant. So for example, Google has more than a billion users. It's worth $360 billion last time I checked. Uh, Facebook has 1.2 billion users. Uh, the, this thesis has resulted in the explosion of the stock price of, of uh, Twitter, worth $25 billion with only $500 million in revenue and no profit. The ex if you look at Zillow, people believe that Zillow will dominate the real estate network. Uber, they think that will, that's a network to network taxi cabs. If you look at... Um, at uh, Priceline and, and, and Netflix and all these other explosions. There are network after network after network. And the general thesis is there's a billion people on the planet that speak English that are between the EU and the United States and the multinationals. Those billion people control 70 to 80% of all the wealth on the planet. If you win the billion, then you'll get the next 5 billion who will have phones. And that means you'll have 6 billion people on the planet that will revolve around your LinkedIn network which is professional, a healthcare network, a whatever network. You, you can basically fill it in blank by blank. Now, FirstNet is a public safety network. The most important country on the face of the earth right now is America because America is the largest, richest English-speaking country, and it controls the technology protocols, Android and iOS. That means that all of these applications and 50% of the world's economy is going to run on technology that's regulated there, right? So that means that the lawmakers here, they are the kingmakers. They decide whether or not you will be the preeminent network or you will not. They can shut down your gambling network. They can shut down your, your magazine network as pornographic. They can turn off your bank or your insurance company. So if you're, if you're anointed or blessed by Washington, D.C., you then become the dominant network in America, which means you then become the dominant network in the EU, which means you then become the dominant network for every global multinational that speaks English, which means you then have the ability to distribute your product at a variable cost of zero to five billion people. So what do I think FirstNet will be? I think the opportunity, I think it's, it's inevitable that it will be funded. It'll be funded by the private sector. If it isn't funded by the public sector, I think that if you actually can create a network that allows for public safety in America, why wouldn't every EU country adopt the same thing? I think it'll metastasize everywhere in the world because there's no other country on earth that has the critical mass of technology and economics and know-how to defeat it. And so things will start here and they're going to ripple out. And uh, the stock market 
uh, is valuing these companies based upon that thesis. Sure. So we have only a little bit of time left, and so I want to get to one other area that we haven't touched on at all today, and that's cybersecurity. You know, this is one of the areas that FEMA has pointed out in its many reports as it studies, you know, the U.S.'s ability to handle emergencies, to respond to them quickly. You know, it's said that cyber is just one of those areas where we appear to be lagging. We don't necessarily have all the components in place. And so, Congresswoman, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. There have been plenty of hearings on the Homeland Security Committee focused on this issue, and a lot of talk about information sharing and critical infrastructure protection coming from the federal government, but not so much about what happens on a, on, on a state level and a local level when it comes to cybersecurity. Can we handle this sort of thing if the worst case scenario happens? Well, uh, I certainly hope that we can, but I have to tell you that in the national preparedness report most recently, cybersecurity is probably our greatest weakness. And it was identified um, our greatest weakness, not only as a country, but certainly for state and local jurisdictions. Only now are really many local jurisdictions beginning to um, put together cyber forces and hire police officers and first responders that understand the cyber threats. And so I think uh, we actually have a long way to go. Um, there, and it's taking, again, once again, too long for Congress to uh, come together and to pass the, the bills that I think we need to pass to ensure that our critical infrastructures are protected. We know the cyber threats that our private sector are enduring every day, the cyber attacks, that is, whether it's on our financial institutions or others, um, it, it's severe. And we need to make sure that they have a mechanism to share with the federal government, that, they're, that they uh, are protected, uh, that you know, their shareholders and, and uh, their customers don't have the ability to sue them if they do share with the federal government. There needs to be a much higher degree of information sharing between the federal government and law enforcement and intelligence and the private sector. Um, but I do think it is something that uh, a lot of our local jurisdictions are I think really only waking up to what could really happen. Uh, but I will say that the infrastructure industries, such as the power industries and others, they are very, they are working day in and day out. I, I meet with them on a regular basis in my district to see what they are doing. And, and we just need to have uh, the private sector, in my view, inform the government about what they are seeing and allow the government as well to inform the private sector. These, uh, these threats are not just coming from hackers like they used to in the past. These are nation states, Iran and China and Russia, that are attacking our uh, infrastructure. And uh, so I think we have a long way to go, at, but we need to accelerate it once again. We need to really accelerate our concerns with respect to cyber attacks. So let, me, let, me, let me jump in there and just say that I, I think it's very true that at the national level, it requires a lot of work, and I wholeheartedly agree with the congresswoman here in terms of how she articulates the issue. But the fact is that cybersecurity is uh, probably the number one threat that concerns uh, everybody here in the United States, including the private sector. You know, I serve on a major board of, a, of, of one of the giant retailers of, of the country. You know, it used to be 10, 15 years ago that the main concern was whether you were having shoplifters coming in the front door. That's not where the private sector is going now. I mean, their big concern is what's happening with cybersecurity and the information that they hold, which has great privacy interests on behalf of the customer base of, of, of all of these companies. And so it's, it, it is a huge, huge issue, and it is the kind of thing where I don't think the answer is a very easy one. In fact, it is not an easy one, uh, but it is the kind of thing that just requires this robust conversation for us as we move into this new age uh, that we have never been in before. Sure, we have just a few minutes left, and so Secretary, I want to get your final thoughts here for, for, for the close of our panel, and this is a question from Twitter. You know, you've served in so many capacities, federal government, state governments, and so I'm interested to hear your thoughts to kind of round us out today as to whether all of these folks are communicating well enough. You know, we've been through so much over the last couple of years. We constantly hear folks lamenting information sharing, but give us your assessment. How have we done? Where do we still need to go from here? So I think when you look back at the last 10, 15 years from Columbine to Virginia Tech to the Gulf of Mexico oil spills to Hurricane Sandy to everything else we're, we're facing, I think the fact is that we have made a huge amount of progress. And I think that everybody who's worked on it uh, should recognize that we have to build on the progress that we have already made. Second of all, I think there's a, 
strong sense that we still need to make a lot more progress. And we're navigating in some spaces where we haven't navigated before. We navigate the whole issue of cybersecurity. It has a constitu constitutional uh, foundation of, of privacy. It also has huge security and financial interests as we try to deal with the protocol there. So what I would say is that this is a robust issue that needs to have a national conversation, the national conversation that we're having here today, the national conversation that Congress should be having. The, the private sector is very involved in this conversation. But we're not quite sure where we're going to go. Uh, but I would say this, uh, we learn from every one of the experiences that we go through. We have a lot more to learn. And my own involvement in many of these uh, disasters uh, and managing them over many years has been, you know, when you have a, an issue, you have to figure out, uh, first of all, how you fix it. And then second of all, how you make sure that you're mitigating against uh, whatever consequences may come when it recurs again. And I think there's a robust process that's going on there, but we still have a long ways to go. Sure, that conversation will continue, but unfortunately ours has to come to a close today. Panelists, all of you, thank you so much for your insights today. Really appreciate it. I want to thank Northrop Grumman, our sponsor, for everyone here in the room and joining us over live stream. Thanks for stopping by and come find us at the next event. Thanks, everyone.